recording. Here we go. And Hello, welcome. Thanks for being here this Tuesday afternoon. We'll get started in just a minute, We're waiting for a few more people to join us. Welcome, folks. Thank you for being here. We're going to give it just a couple more minutes um, as folks are coming in from the waiting room, coming in from other meetings. It's just one minute after the hour here on a beautiful, beautiful spring afternoon um, here in the Chicago region. Um, and you are here with us today for our cafe, Building Agriculture Infrastructure in the Chicago Wilderness Region to Support Sustainability. We're gonna get started in just, just a couple minutes. Um, thank you for being here. We're gonna start in just one more minute. If that, thank you everyone who has joined us just a couple of minutes after the hour here for today's Chicago Wilderness Alliance Cafe. And for those of you who are here, um, if you could please add, please add your name and organization to the chat. Um, Laura, why don't we get started? It looks like things are slowing down coming in from the waiting room. We have a lot of great stuff to talk about today. So I'll turn it over to you for a quick welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are pleased to have the support of the Illinois Department of uh, Natural Resources and the US Forest Service to support our CAFE series. And um, because trees and equity are important to them, um, please click the link to find out more information about how you can become a Tree City USA. And I will also drop some information about how to host a cafe in the future. If you're interested in a topic and you'd like to host a cafe, we are always looking for interested um, folks to step forward and we have a, a very simple process to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Welcome everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's Chicago Wilderness Alliance Cafe. Um, building agriculture infrastructure in the Chicago wilderness area to support sustainability. My name is Brandon Hayes. I'm with Bold Bison Communications and Consulting, um, and we've been working to support the green vision initiatives of the Chicago wilderness region. What are the green vision initiatives? Well, they're right there on your screen. Um, there are seven of them that were identified as being key to where we see a healthy, sustainable, um, conserved, preserved Chicago region by 2030. So as you can see, managing healthy landscapes, growing with agriculture, the topic of today's cafe, prioritizing green infrastructure, protecting landscapes for biodiversity conservation, increasing equitable access to nature, taking climate action, protecting healthy water. None of these initiatives alone will get us to where we want to be by 2030. And you see that they are interlocking and none of them stands as an island. They are all connected. And that's something that we're going to talk a lot about today in terms of growing with agriculture, thinking about farmland and agriculture as part of a healthy and sustainable Chicago region. Um, it is key to um, part to the Chicago Wilderness Initiatives to make sure that we embrace and engage a land use that's 4.4 million acres of agricultural lands within our Chicago wilderness region. The Chicago wilderness region, as you know, extends through four states from Wisconsin through Illinois, Indiana, and into a little bit of Michigan in the Southwest corner there. You're gonna hear a lot more about sort of the priorities of 
the Growing with Agriculture Initiative, um, which is co-chaired by Tim Brennan and Daniel Suarez. Tim will be the host and moderator of our conversation today. But note that the strategies include developing and use, utilizing standard measurements adopted across the region to track and assess agricultural lands to support nature-based farming practices. Listening, listening is so key and so important. Listening to farmers and supporting spaces and events for them to network and share resources and ideas um, with things like the Chicago Wilderness Alliance cafes and field trips being part of that um, and maintaining and expanding regular events. Again, like those field days, um, in all of the states so that folks are able to learn and connect um, between the agriculture community, the food community, and the Chicago wilderness community. To just give you a sense of the sort of scope of folks who are involved, um, just briefly, like I mentioned, we have the leaders, Tim Brennan, Daniel Suarez, Maggie Solis also helping. Um, and then look at all those names in the Ag team, the Conservation Fund, Shirley Hines Land Trust, and on the McHenry County Conservation District, Open Lands, the Conservation Foundation, American Farmland Trust, Nature Conservancy, a who's who essentially of conservation and thinking about food and ag in the Chicago wilderness region. So we just wanted to put those, flash those names up there, give you a sense of how many folks are involved with this conversation. Um, but I promised I would keep this very short because we have a really great team um, today sharing their experiences. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim Brennan, um, one of the co-chairs of the initiative to moderate today's conversation. For those of you who have any issues or questions as we go, please feel free to put any questions in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on them. If you have any technical difficulties, please reach out to Laura Riley, to myself, to my colleague, Natalie, um, or to Lake, who are all here to help make sure things run smoothly. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tim Brennan. Thank you so much, Brandon. We appreciate that introduction. Um, I am very proud and pleased uh, to serve as a co-chair of this committee. Um, I grew up on a farm in northeastern Ohio. I live on a small hobby farm uh, in Crete, Illinois, so I'm about 35 miles south of the loop. Um, the biggest news down here is we added turkeys to our farm last week, and it's been a lot of fun since then. Uh, but I also serve as vice president for Farm Foundation, which is a 90-year-old organization based here in Chicago that is a national and international organization that's kind of a half a think tank, half a do tank, and we work on all major issues in the food and agricultural supply chain. We're nonpartisan. We don't lobby. We don't advocate. What we're experts at are bringing people together that don't necessarily ever sit down and talk. And we work out practical solutions for agriculture. And that's what brought me to this and what's brought us to this moment, because uh, what we did last year when we kicked off the, this, uh, this agricultural green vision was to load up a bus full of 50 people from a wide variety of organizations and backgrounds. And we took them on a tour of five farms here in Will County last June. And we did that uh, both as learning and as sharing. Uh, we wanted to learn about some of the issues facing farmers here in the Chicagoland area, but to also share with those farmers that, that we had a vision and that we had ideas about the future of agriculture. And so we took a really open approach to that. And uh, we, everyone let down their guard and, and went and learned about the vast array of types and thoughts behind, behind agriculture just in Will County. And it was a remarkable experience. But one of the biggest takeaways we had was that farmers uh, that were sort of traditional row crop, chemical-based farming uh, here in the Chicagoland area, almost every one of them said that they wanted to change their practices. They wanted to either change what they grew, they wanted to change how they grew, they wanted to make their farm sustainable for their multi-generation uh, family to thrive in that space. But what kept them from doing that was infrastructure, whether that's infrastructure for uh, if I wanted to grow, say, organic oats, I could not find a grain elevator in the Chicagoland area at a reasonable distance that could take those oats and market them for me. I would have to drive over two and a half hours, probably to Quincy or somewhere even farther in order to sell those oats. Now, I will tell you, oats are not particularly valuable. And by the time I delivered them to Quincy, they'd pretty much be worthless. So, so that's why we don't see a lot of the things that we think we should see in the Chicagoland area, because our infrastructure is set up to support traditional corn and bean production. 
which is fine, but it does not serve the needs of the city of Chicago. It does not serve the needs of its citizens, and it does not serve our, con our conservation-minded minded environmentalist farmers. It is not what they want to do. And I'm, I'm speaking broadly here. There are some that are perfectly fine with that, and they work well within that system, and we don't want to force anybody to change what they're doing. But we do want to provide opportunities for farms to evolve and to, to be more sustainable and to feed more of the Chicagoland region. And part of what we thought about when we started this green initiative was we had just all come through COVID. And we were familiar with some of the early food shortages and the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables they were not available in our region. You had to go to Michigan, you had to go to Wisconsin, you had to go outside of the Chicagoland area for the most part, unless you had access to community gardens within the city. For the most part, the farmers around here can't generally feed the citizens, especially during time of duress like that. So uh, that's a lot of where we came from. Uh, Brandon, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share a couple of slides and then uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, Slide has disappeared. There we go. So when we're talking, oops. oops. So when we're talking about ag infrastructure, what we're really referring to is, is everything, including farms, farmers markets all the businesses that support a farm within a given area um, within our our region particularly infrastructure is also workers seeds input sellers equipment dealers grain elevators marketers buyers the the entire thing um, of course as i mentioned earlier we're, we're predominantly supporting mid to large scale conventionally grown grain crops um, for production so for us the future, this green infrastructure that we're talking about, this new infrastructure would, you know, first of all, that it requires a high amount of technology. And for that, we need to increase our broadband access. We need to protect the farmland from development. Uh, I think the general ethos in the in the Chicago land area is that farmland is simply land waiting to be developed. We need to change the way we think about that. Uh, more access to renewable energy resources, vibrant local markets that improve, that reward innovation and improve production practices, access to a lot more short haul shipping, storage and sales. And of course, a well-trained and skilled workforce is required for this new infrastructure. And I'm going to stop there because I would like to introduce somebody that uh, is a great natural resource in the Chicago land area and is actually a force of nature when it comes to protecting farmland and creating this green infrastructure. And we're absolutely thrilled to have Janice Hill from King County uh, join us for this. I don't think anybody knows this subject uh, better than Janice. And so I'm going to ask her to take over. And Janice, I'll bring up your slides while you introduce yourself. Sure. Good morning, everyone. It's really good to see all my friends and colleagues here. Always good, good to see everyone. Um, I think all of you know that I come from a, a farm family. My grandparents farmed, my cousins farm in Michigan. And, you know, it's a passion for me and it's a family tradition. It's just my way of uh, getting my hands in the soil working on this stuff. But I'm a land use planner by training and background and prac. I'd say uh, the first half of my career was in the development world. And uh, then, you know, I was lucky enough to start working for the for Kane County um, that had the broader approach and the long policy history of supporting farmland. And, um, you know, from that, then I was able to bring forth my passion. But I did learn a lot about the development world. And I want to say that all of us in the Chicago wilderness region are really working in an environment that is development focused. And not agriculture focused, not natural resource focused. So, um, you know, when we think about that, that's the structure, that's the infrastructure that we work within. Um, so it, to change that, and I do believe that change is possible to create that, um, it's going to take an all hands on deck. You don't have to be an ag professional, you don't have to be a planner. In fact, I think we all need to activate our communities um, across the board, our citizen communities to do some of this work. I'm going to throw up a couple challenges that I see. Um, you know, Tim outlined the 
all of the ag infrastructure, the infrastructure that we need to focus on. Um, but there are other things too. My first tip for you of the day is that is to think about those ARPA funds that are within the communities. Kane County is about to issue about in the next few months, about to issue grants to farmers for using that ag infrastructure funds. Now, of course, when they wrote the legislation, infrastructure was not at the ag infrastructure was not at the top of the list for the ARPA for the rescue funds, but it's eligible. Um, farms are incorporated, either non, not for profit or for profit, and they obviously took one of the hugest hits uh, during COVID. So, you know, there there's money out there, and my suspicion is going to be every community is going to have some leftover funds. They have to use them by a certain date. So my challenge to you and suggestion to you is ask your communities, your counties, your municipalities, have you spent your ARPA funds? Are you going to spend all your ARPA funds? What about um, for our farmers? What about what can we offer them? Uh, it's a simple, it can be a simple grant process. Uh, look at the state of Maine. They have an ag infrastructure program. We're copying it. I mean, customizing it, copy, customize. That's also one of my big tricks. But I'm going to give you, um, you know, you can see right here on the screen, some thoughts about uh, infrastructure and, you know, have we made a place for these topics, right? The, the controlled environment, I really believe that's going to be part of the future uh, for production. Um, and of course, a net zero one would be best, best right? You know, questions for your communities that you live in and work in, you know, where do we provide for this? Uh, where are these going to sit in our communities? And what are they going to look like? So that's the first thing, the future, keeping that in mind that that's a big part of um, our future. The soil, I say, is the gift. I mean, I'm learning this. I'm not a soil scientist. And in fact, I will be honest with you, my planning background was great. It was design focused. And it, they really didn't spend enough, I think, in the natural resources. Um, now that I look back, it was many, many years ago. But who are our soil scientists? Who are the protectors and advisors of our soil. We have to start there. We have some shifting challenges with soil here, um, but we need to put that right out in the front when we talk about infrastructure. For all of us in the region, you know, this fragmented land base, um, you know, as a planner, I see it, I look at an area and it's like, whoa, what, what is this? Just flew into town um, from California and I'm looking down and I'm thinking, my gosh, what have we done? over mostly our prime soils. We have the best soils in the world here. And, you know, what, what do we have here? And where where can you farm? Now, the thinking used to be you could only farm if you had these thousands and hundreds and thousands of undisturbed tracts of land. But I'm going to challenge and say, what do we do? What do we offer in our beginning farmers um, that maybe need 10 acres or less. And can they build a house? This is the big thing. They need to be on site. Can they build a barn and a house? And where are we going to allow for this? This is the challenge for our entire community. And then finally, of course, not finally, but you know, like again, top of mind, climate for us, it's wet or super dry. Okay, next slide. So I'm putting out all these challenges, but I'm, I'm also saying, you know, here's how we can frame the questions and the challenges. I think we need to definitely partner with the universities and colleges and have some of that young brain power working on behalf of uh, the, the work that we need to get done here. I would um, ask developers and communities, how do you invest how do you finance and how are you going to entitle these growing spaces, these controlled growth? And that's everywhere in the built environment, you know, everywhere we need some of this because we have that weather challenge of uh, only having a certain amount of uh, time to grow in ground. The other tool, how many of you know about the LESA system, L-E-S-A? It should really be something that we all know 
about in our community if we're going to protect our soils and our environment and know where to grow. Uh, it's actually a system developed by USDA and most of us are counties and um, soil and water districts have partnered to have a LISA system. Now, yes, you can take the federal, you know, broad template and adopt it and say, there you are. But I'll tell you here, for the most part, it is based on how do I, get, how do I build uh, as a developer on my prime, on, on our soils here. We can customize this. We see uh, in Iowa, for example, they've customized their LISA to protect the best soils, to protect organic soils, and even to flip the script to say, where, what do we want to protect first before we decide where we want to build? If we even took that approach in our region, in our Chicago wilderness area, by looking at all of that, we, this could be a game changer for us. It's a tool that you have to use if you're going to do anything uh, significant on your land. So let's think about that. That's a great partnership with colleges that we could work on. Of course, zoning and planning, you know, that's my um, pocket there that I come from. Um, not everyone's going to be able to have an easement. So the question is, what kind of planning and zoning do we have? Are we keeping an eye on that? And as Tim mentioned, mostly not land waiting, just waiting to be developed. Uh, I just looked at a comprehensive plan in one of our communities in Kane and the it was the consultant prepared and it was, you know, they, they created waiting, these waiting zones. And it's like, we've got to change that perspective. And maybe, our, maybe we need to have some more uh, consulting firms on participating in our work here. Just that was uh, insight that I had from that. And then finally, at the bottom there, if you can see the Midwest Climate Hub, this is a tool that we should all um you know, start, you know, tab it and start looking at it. Um, I went in and just kind of pulled up Kane County just to look at uh, some of the data they have. They have some really great data um, mapped, which is always fun to see it mapped and charts and things. You know, the, we know we have microclimates within Kane County. I mean, it's amazing. Like one part of the county, you've got hail and the other part you have sunshine, right? Um, same with the disaster zones declared certain parts. It's not always uh, universal throughout the county. I was amazed at like the temperature change county by county going north, you know, from McHenry um, one direction and uh, in terms of overall climate and growing days and growing days differing in Kendall County. So let's take a look at the changes within our um within our region and within our neighbors so that we can start to understand the differences. So those are my suggestions of just some projects that we could all work on and activate each other um, alongside the other built things that we need to have. When we talk about uh, farmland and infrastructure, I think most people's minds go to big row crops that you see on the edges of Chicago and in the in the collar counties. But at Chicago Wilderness and, and certainly at, at Farm Foundation, uh, you know, any land that is producing food is a farm and it can be it could be the site of a city lot, it could be an acre in the city, but it, uh, thinking about the infrastructure that's needed to support those local markets, because what we've learned and how they've evolved over the past couple of decades is they are places where the consumer learns, they're places where the workforce is trained, they are places that, that are changing our cities and enriching our lives. And it is important when we talk about these issues of the future of farming that we include urban uh, growing as part of this, which is why we're really happy to have Paul Krisik from Windy City Harvest with us, which is a brilliant program of the Chicago Botanic Garden. He is the director of strategic initiatives there, and he's going to tell us uh, his thoughts on this topic. So, Paul. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction of who I am, and then I'm going to go talk about the work that we're doing here in Chicago, and then just a little bit about some of the barriers um, our farmers face, um, especially within this urban setting. Um, so I'm from Chicago, I grew up 
on the south side. I did not grow up on a farm, but I've been farming both rurally and urban in urban environments since 2011. Um, and I've been working with the Botanic Garden since 2015 in multiple kinds of roles. Um, a lot of the programs, I've worked in a lot of the programs that I'll in introduce to you in a second. Um, but I just wanna thank like Janice and everybody for having this like very important conversation because I think this is a conversation that needs to happen to set up the 21st century for to have farmers be a more of a local household kind of like vocabulary in our households um, versus having a lot of our food, as we all know, come from very far away and how we could all support our local farmers, not only like at a household level, but more like infrastructurally zoning wise and everything. So thank you so much for this conversation. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I love to share pictures. Um, so you could also see some of the great work that the team does. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my my screen. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. So um, my work is with the Chicago Botanic Garden, and I work with our urban agriculture department um, named Windy City Harvest. Um, if anybody doesn't know, the Botanic Garden is um, up on the north side of Chicago. Our department is actually housed on the west side of Chicago in the North Lawndale um, area. Central Park and Ogden, if everyone wants to come visit, we are open to the public Wednesdays to Saturdays. Feel free to come visit. We do have a year-round farm stand as well. Um, this is where the farm in Ogden is. It is in um, North Lawndale, which if anybody doesn't know, it's a West Side neighborhood, predominantly African-American, and it's been historically disinvested in. Here's a couple of pictures of the farm in Ogden of like our location here. Uh, this is kind of our central hub. You can see we have greenhouses, we have outside um, we have outside growing spaces. We do have a year-round farm stand, which is one of the pictures over here. Again, open Wednesday to Saturday, shameless plug. Um, some of the, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the programs. We have a lot of different initiatives happening at our department. Um, basically, they focus around three different topics, food, health, and jobs. So food-wise is across our different sites across the city, which we have multiple sites across the city. We grow over 100,000 pounds of produce every single year. And we then market it to two, basically two different price points. We sell it at a high price point, And then we also sell about 50% of it at a low price point to make sure it's affordable to our communities. Um, that's food. Health is we have a lot of different initiatives, including um, this initiative uh, I have up on the screen right now. We run a program with two federally qualified health centers where we, anybody who has a diet related disease, and that means if you are at risk with um, diabetes or hypertension, any anything with, that falls within that category, you could get a prescription from your local provider for a free box of vegetables once a week. And that and you could come to us, um, we'll fill that prescription for you. And then you also with that, you get a cooking class and also a uh, nutrition demo as well. Um, the whole, point of VeggieRx, as we call it, is to help change people's dietary habits. I don't know about you, but it took me out forever, even after I started farming, to start eating more vegetables. So we also run a youth farm program where we employ high schoolers from around the surrounding communities, both here in North Lawndale and Washington Park on the south side, um, helping um, teenagers and our youth in the communities get introduced to agriculture and to help them gain the experience and the skills for whatever they want to do after high school, school, work, you know, going on to the workforce, whatever it might be. Um, we also do aquaponics, a little bit of controlled agriculture as well. Right now, our system is producing about 2,200 heads of lettuce a week, and I don't know the numbers of heads of, or pounds of basil a week, but we wanted to have a place where since controlled agriculture, hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics, all of those are a booming industry within a lot of urban areas across the country. So we want to have a training ground to help people become comfortable, go into the interviews to go into a lot of those companies that we see that are opening up in the Chicagoland area. The third one that I'm going to talk about, so we went over food, health, and jobs, is the jobs one, which I want to focus on today, is that we have a lot of different training initiatives for people um, entering into the workforce and also entering into the local agricultural like workforce that we're all talking about today. 
Um, the first one is our core program. So people who have been involved in the justice system, we all know have a hard time trying to find a job for multiple reasons. Um, we run a program where we hire about 35 individuals a year. And for 14 weeks, we um, train them Monday through Thursday in agricultural skills, landscaping skills, um, anywhere from logistics, food safety, to how to work as a team. Um, Fridays, they're in the classroom doing resume building, other kinds of workshops on like, um, whatever the cohort really needs, anywhere from resume to maybe it's your um, first time opening a bank account, whatever it might be. Um, the whole point of it is to try to help them find a permanent employment at the end of their time with us. Um, and a lot of them become very interested in agriculture and they wanna keep, want keep moving on to this pathway. Um, that's where our production assistant program is, is that we save about five to eight slots um, after the core program where we um, hire them on full time. And then they help us around all around the farms. They also help teach the next generation of core coming in and everything. Here's a pictures of our of our um, production assistants right now. Um, and they begin, they just keep building their skills in local agriculture, urban agriculture. That program then feeds into the next program, which is just not too far away from our farm in Ogden location. Um, it's at the Arturo Velasquez Institute, which is a city college or is a satellite of the Daly College, which is the city college of Chicago. The apprenticeship program is one of our main training programs where we train individuals to become uh, local urban farm farmers, where the whole goal is that they could then manage a local urban farm or help someone else manage a local urban farm or start their own local urban farm. It's a nine month program, 31 college credit hours um, approved, and it goes over best practices of transplanting soil science, food safety, anything that you really need to know to really um, start managing one of these places. Um, we've been going for a couple of years now and we have over 150, 160 alumni somewhere in the Chicagoland area or beyond from there. Um, a lot of our alumni go on to work at other organizations, start their own farms either in the city or other places. Um, for example, we just had a farmer just start a 20 acre farm down in South Cook County. Another farmer is now in New Hampshire Hi. starting a farm um, after he moved out to the East Coast. Um, so it's one of our training programs because we all know that the, the USDA, if you're under 10 years, is still considered a beginning farmer. So we want to make sure that a lot of our farmers are getting off on the right foot, start practicing the best practices that we've learned over the years and have most of the support that they have. So in this program, about a fourth of it is from our other internal programs, like the core program I just mentioned, and it's also open to um, other Chicagoans or people from around Chicago who are interested in going into local agriculture. The last program that I will talk about is our incubator program. So it's kind of we're kind of talking about a, a pipeline program, um, helping people get to the next step. We also run an incubator farm which is down in Bronzeville on the south side of Chicago, where we rent out one eighth of an acre plots of land that come with water access. It comes with a washback station. It comes with um, mentoring, both like operational wise and also business wise as well for graduates of the apprenticeship program that want to start their own business ventures. Um, we modeled this off of Albo Organics out in California. So we took a lot of what we what they learned and we incorporated here in Chicago. Um, and since our inception, I, I think we incubated somewhere above about 20 different incubator businesses. A lot of them are still in operation some kind of way. Either they are operating in Chicago or outside of Chicago, or they've changed their business model in some kind of way. Um, we all know that some of the barriers for farmers are land, um, access, or water access, um, tools, finance, access to markets. We really try to um, alleviate a lot of those barriers through this program for our farmers. So our farmers are on the land anywhere from about two to five years, and we try to help them find that next step, whatever that might be. So a little bit about what the barriers our farmers face. Land access, I mean, just finance land in Chicago is 
really, really high. Land everywhere is very, very high. And also just like proper land requirements. Um, does it have a water access safe? Can I pull a truck into it? All the logistics that a lot of farmers maybe don't realize, especially because we're beginning, beginning farmers. And then in five years, like, oh, I do need that. So really trying to help people find proper farmland. Market access, um, farmers markets are saturated in Chicago right now, at least a lot of the ones that you could get a higher price point at. Wholesale barriers, for example, just food safety certifications. A lot of wholesalers are asking for like gap certifications, um, following FISMA guidelines, Food Safety Modernization Act guidelines. And also for a beginning farmer, navigating that and becoming certified is a very hard process. Right now, our farmers are gap certified because they come into group gap with us. So they at least like learn the process of how to get food safety certified. And also just the price points. Um, it's it's very hard, especially um, with the market saturation, to find people, restaurants, customers that actually pay the price point for what you want to sell. Um, logistics and operations, trained staff versus volunteers. A lot of urban farms rely on volunteers, especially in the first like one to five years. We all know that you know having a volunteer day is out there. Out there is very great, but actually having enough finance to actually pay another farmer or someone who's experienced to help really manage a farm, your farm is so valuable. Um, especially with the time allocation is that a lot of our farmers, most farmers in the United States have some kind of like other part-time job somewhere. So a lot of our farmers, they're working a full-time job, going into the evenings into their farm site, going onto the weekends of their farm site. Um, so having just that time and having that the support as well. And then a lot of professional support. Our farmers are really good at growing, but maybe they need a little bit of help with like their business aspects, their books, marketing, legal matters. And then just, I also, I just had like mental support as well. We all know that farming is like very, very hard and very hard on individuals as well. So trying to connect them with as many resources. The last thing is just, I want to talk about possible solutions that I think would be very beneficial to the Chicago land area. Um, larger incubator programs where people could then graduate onto ready farm land and also having, again, properly zoned and properly protected farmland. And even in the, within the uh, city of Chicago as well. Um, we have a lot of different zoning, but just making sure that we actually have farmable land for people that want to make this a career. Market access. Um, just incentives for people to buy hyper local in any kind of way, and also just any kinds of food hubs. Right now, there are a lot of mid scale wholesalers that are working with our farmers or trying to work with their farmers, but there's so much farmers and so much supply that want to go into wholesale and they have so many barriers. So, just having a centralized food hub that can help train farmers and focus on working with a small percentage of like beginning farmers to help build their capacity. Uh, logistics food hubs offer pickup loan. One of the biggest things for our farmers is just finding a, a vehicle to go and deliver their CSA boxes or anything. Just so, just having any kind of like additional support as well. Um, a certified apprenticeship program through like the states, Wisconsin, and I know Pennsylvania have one. So having something like that in the Illinois, in the Illinois region. And finally, just professional supports. There are a lot of support systems for farmers within the, like the United States and everything, but it's as a beginning farmer, they just need support navigating those systems. So having somebody that can be on your side, it's like, this is how you access uh, FarmLink and all the other systems that maybe other farmers, especially if you come from a family of farmers, you might know of, but especially for somebody who is in year one to five to 10, a lot of those systems, you just don't know of them. So anyway, thank you for, for listening to my presentation. And thank you again for having this conversation, inviting me. Thank you so much, Paul. That was really fantastic. And, and I think sets up our next speaker very well. The one thing that we've discovered here within Chicago Wilderness and within our ag community is that when we take the time to sit down and share our problems with each other, we can find solutions together and we can find that someone else has, has been wringing their hands over the same issue that you're wringing their hands over and they may have solutions. And I think one of the best people for that is our next speaker and that's Liz Stelk from the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. She is a connector and she can make things happen. So Liz, 
give it to you to go next. Wow, Tim, thank you for that kind introduction uh, and for the opportunity today. Um, you know, Janice and Paul really laid out what the challenges are, and I, I hope I can build on that. So um, I'm Liz Moran Stelk. I'm in South Suburban Homewood, um, the executive director of the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. I uh, just a little bit about myself before I tell you more. Uh, I grew up in a union household in the southwest suburbs. My dad was a carpenter, and he used to tell us tell us all the time, "Everything we have is because we have a union," and uh, that really stuck with me. So my career was you know was in union and community organizing for a long time, and then about a decade ago, I uh, got really burned out and went for a complete departure from that world to work on a farm for a year to see if I had the gumption to cut it. Uh, I, I don't, but I had a really transformational experience while I was at the farmer's market. You know, I, I grew up, we, we never went to farmer's markets. So I didn't really know that there was this sort of alternative local sustainable food system. And I was selling at the farmer's market and it was in a small town and there was hundreds of people there. And uh, the folks, loved the farmer that I worked for. They loved this food. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me as an organizer, like if we could organize these farmers and the people who love them, we would have, we have the potential power to really impact and change the food system. So that's really what we do at the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. So we are a statewide nonprofit, nonpartisan, membership-based alliance of farmers and eaters and we use our voices and our choices to shape a more just and regenerative food system. And by that, we mean we should use our, to our purchasing power to buy local and sustainable and organic food as much as we can, whenever we can. But we're not going to shop our way out of this food system. We also need to change the policies and the system that really cements the status quo of industrial agriculture and food that's really not working for people or the planet, and that's going to take building collective power. So um, I'm going to start first. You know, many of these, many of you don't need this reminder because you buy local and you support sustainable agriculture. I think it's really clear or important to be clear about why local food matters. So first of all, small farms and family farms, the existence of them really matters. I want to just be clear. The people that feed us really matter. And they are stewards of the land, whereas absentee landowners or large, large corporations, they don't necessarily value protecting the land or our natural resources. So, um, you know, keeping farm land in the hands of people who care about it and their communities really matters. But in light of the climate crisis, uh, it's also really valuable that we reduce our food miles. Um, but the reality is, although that's important, the reality is that... Um, Carbon and emissions from transportation that uh, is actually like transportation to move food is actually super efficient. Uh, it's much more efficient these days. And so um, the carbon impact of actually moving food is less than the production of food itself, and including the production of chemical, synthetic chemical inputs that are fossil fuel based. So um, what we really uh, need and what, the, um, what we really care about is the urgency to build climate resilience. And in Illinois, that's two pieces. So one is local food security. So we're in a state with 23 million acres of farmland, but we import 95% of what we eat here. So we're surrounded by farmland and we have nothing to eat. <laughs> and the pandemic made that, you know, especially clear. A lot of people experienced that uncertainty um and for the first time during the during the pandemic when you know shelves were empty and so local food producers many of our uh members experienced an incredible skyrocketing demand for their food but of course um you know the skyrocketing demand unexpectedly also cuts both ways so it was really great it was also really painful for um farmers to have to deal with all of the complex issues of demand um, so, but we also have a really serious farm nutrient pollution problem in Illinois, and it's only going to get worse with climate. And um, so we also need to transition what we grow here into more diverse rotations. 
And Tim alluded to this earlier when he said that the farmers in Will County want to grow different things, but they don't have the infrastructure to do that. And so in order to do that, to facilitate that, we have to build the market infrastructure, not just for specialty crops, like we're not just talking about local food as fruits and vegetables, but it, in Illinois, it's also grains and meat livestock production. So um, I, again, Tim mentioned this about the, if you grow oats, that the nearest elevator is two hours away. One of the really ex existing challenges of corn and bean infrastructure that we've built that is super efficient and then is that it's intended for commodities that are exactly the same. So there's no identity preservation in that system. So even, so like exact organic as an example, if you grow organic grain, you need your whole supply chain to keep that grain separate from commodity grain so that you can earn that premium for growing with organic practices. But the reality is we don't have that for corn and bean production that is more sustainable and so there's not a strong incentive. There's not a market incentive for those folks to be more sustainable because they are just going to sell to the elevator and they're going to get the same price as the guy who doesn't use sustainable practices. So that's also a problem with infrastructure. So to get to a more local uh, and regional food system that's different than what we have now, we have to rebuild the, the infrastructure that moves food from farm to table. and. Um, for right now, the best place to find that food is at the farmer's market or a local food co-op. But if we want to feed local food, be regular food in the grocery stores, in schools, in hospitals, farmers are going to need access to aggregation, cold storage, value-added processing, and distribution. And so aggregation, to be clear, that pulling, you know, aggregating products together from a bunch of farms, which helps being able to have the amount that you need that a, a buyer needs, excuse me. Um, so that really helps open up more institutional markets if your farm is too small to provide the amount that they need. Cold storage is one of the biggest challenges of farms, both on the farm and again, in aggregation basic value-added processing to many institutional buyers. Like they don't want just a raw product. They need it either cut or cleaned or chopped or something like that. And then of course, distribution. So we're not a blank slate in Illinois in the Chicago food shed. There are some really incredible models of success like down at the farms, Marty Travis's uh, aggregation effort um, in Fairbury, central Illinois pulls together food from that's uh, specialty crop and grain and meat and dairy and eggs from over 60 farms in central Illinois, aggregates it together and then distributes it to farm to table restaurants and other purchases in Chicago. It's an incredible model of aggregation and distribution. And it also helps all of those 60 farms that are need to focus on what they do best, which is growing excellent food. They don't have to worry about um, marketing or those sort of relationships. They can just let Marty deal with it down the farms. There's also Fresh Picks, the online grocery store, which also does ordering and delivering in Chicago. There's a really excellent effort called the Farmstead, which is a new cooperatively owned um, basic value added processing center that's opening in Mount Pulaski in central Illinois. Again, another model of um, farmers themselves wanting to bring their products together so that they can open markets like in schools and institutions. And there's also the Leaf Food Hub in Southern Illinois. So, so we're, which is again, <laughs> aggregation and distribution. So farmers are really uh, coming together to fill this infrastructure gap, but the reality is these projects are incredibly costly, they're complicated. Um, and from a traditional agriculture, uh, you know, finance perspective, many of these folks are riskier borrow borrowers um, and they, you know, they have systems to support regular commodity production in agriculture, not these, you know, different models or different kinds of production that might have, you know, um, various prices for things and that sort of thing. So there are some good, really good actors in this space who are financing some of these projects. Compere Financial has a, a really great program to support small and local food producers, including 
um, financing that's really small, like as small as $5,000 to get to farmers, which is really helpful. The state has the Ag Invest Program, which is the state treasurer's program, which is another uh, potential borrower. And then there's a new effort, uh, Social Impact Fund launching in the Chicago Food Shed called the Proofing Station, which you'll also hear more about, but it's, it's going to also look to invest in these kind of um, this infrastructure to fill this, this gap. Uh, but the reality is we cannot let policymakers off the hook. It's, it can't just be left to private uh, industry to, to sort of fund this. Um, and so our food security really matters. And so we can't let state lawmakers and federal um, not also prioritize and invest in local and regional food security. So um, uh, with our members, um, it, it's Carrie, yes, I will put in the chat the resources for you for sure. Um, so our members, you know, come together to identify problems and then come up with the solutions that they think are best. And then we organize and advocate around those. And so um, we've addressed farmers market permits and regulation and cottage food processing and co-op laws on seed libraries. But this year, it was really important that we focus on this local food infrastructure in part because Illinois is, has just received the Illinois Department of Agriculture just entered into a cooperative agreement with the USDA to bring $14 million of purchasing local food from underserved farmers to feed uh, communities in need. And so that program is great. But if you can't move the food from farm to table, you need that infrastructure. And so we, we have a proposal with the state legislature called the Local Food Infrastructure Grant, which is a $2 million program that would, uh, in fact, Janice mentioned earlier that Maine has a similar program on infrastructure and nearly every Midwestern state around us has one a grant program for building the local food economy. Illinois can follow their lead. And before, I can see the time is running out, so before, I leave. I'm going to put in the chat. This is also the last week of the legislature in Springfield. So if you haven't, I encourage you to use our action, our take action opportunity to encourage your lawmaker to support the local food infrastructure grant. Um, and just building on that to, uh, to cut this short is the farm bill is coming up for renewal. There is, there is a local food, local farms and food act. And that's a marker bill that's going to invest in this kind of local infrastructure. For the first time, there's a proposal that would allow infrastructure and equipment purchases, which federal funding has never allowed before. But we are pushing for that with our lawmakers. Illinois has five members of Congress that are writing the, agri the um, farm bill on the Agriculture Committee and Senator Durbin. So it's a really essential time to advocate for a local food and farm bill. But Last thought, ultimately, <laughs> we can build a local food system, um, but, uh, um, you know, only folks who can afford it are going to be able to access that. And so we have to, we need a just transition from what we have now to a more local and regenerative food system. And that is going to require big action to address consolidation and uh, restore competition in the food system, address massive income inequality in this country and corporate power and campaign finance. Those are all really big picture things that would also help us change the food system. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Liz. That was fantastic. So uh, Illinois is the largest producer of soybean in the United States. Uh, this past year, I believe we became the largest producer of corn. We're also the largest producer of horseradish and pumpkins in the United States. But the thing to know is that this isn't going to last. The United States is no longer the leading agricultural power in the world. We are now behind Brazil and will always be behind Brazil because they have a double growing season. What's going to enable American agriculture uh, not only to exist, but to exceed and to grow is to become a regenerative system that produces specialty crops, whether those are commodity crops or food crops. And so it, it calls upon the entire system to evolve at a very rapid pace. 
Now, one thing that we think can help do that is taking some land that was set aside about 30 years ago for a third airport in Piatone, Illinois, which is about four miles south of where I'm sitting right now. Um, the idea was to build a third Chicago airport. Nothing has really happened. I won't go deep into those details, but rather we wanna focus on the future and we wanna make a recommendation to the state of Illinois that that land be turned over back to the farmers, but in a different way. We would like to build, we, I'm saying a collective we, uh, we're growing that we, and I would hope you would all would wanna join us on this, but the idea came from the Chicago Wilderness Ag Committee um, to use that land for regenerative farming. And it would be a, a place where new and beginning farmers could learn at scale regenerative farm practices. Um, as Liz mentioned, the absence of livestock in the Chicago land area. We would like this, uh, this land to be used for livestock production and livestock processing. We also think that it could be an agritourism site. It can be a site uh, to teach the consumers about food, but everything at scale, there's over, I believe, five to 7,000 acres available that is uh, some of the best farmland in the state of Illinois, without exaggerating, it's remarkable soil. Um, and uh, it, it is an opportunity that I think is unprecedented and we can become a national leader in regenerative agriculture and education and change our food system in a really different way. Um, and so this has gained energy and momentum um, thanks to some folks on the committee, it has made it, this idea has made its way to the state house already. Um, I will be testifying in front of the Will County Board on June 1st and sort of pitching our full fleshed out idea for this. Um, but if you hear about it, if you, uh, if you can help us spread the word, but ultimately what we're looking for right now within our committee is to find opportunities to partner and champion existing projects that are improving infrastructure. So whether that's a project like Green Era in the Deering neighborhood, some of the things that Paul and Liz and Janice spoke about, we'd like to bring that the, the body of, of Chicago Wilderness behind some of these important projects that are happening as both a learning opportunity, but as an opportunity to, to ensure that these things take off. And so please share your ideas, share your projects with us, um, and, uh, and we can, I hope, help you. Now, I know we only have five minutes left, but are there any questions? Brandon, I don't know the, the best way uh, to do this, but is there anything that you'd like to ask anybody before we go? If you have a question, please go ahead and, and um, take yourself off mute and speak it into the room. And we can always schedule a part two to this discussion as well. Hi, I'm uh, Bob Hoyer, HNA Networks. A uh, question for Paul and, and the youth employment opportunities. What, what kind of synergies do you see uh, with uh, the new mayor, Brandon Johnson? He's issued an executive order looking at youth employment, asking the city budget to, uh, office to like scan all inventory. Is there a strategy within the city to take advantage of that around youth employment? Not to my knowledge just yet. We're also, from what I can predict, a lot of youth employment is going to expand across like Chicago in a lot of different regions, not just like in agriculture, but there's a lot of other like employment initiatives in Chicago and a lot of other like, let's call them green collar um, kinds of like industries. So I could see it expanding, but I'm not, I'm not sure about the details yet. Anybody else? All right, well, let's let's do this again soon and we'll, we can dig even deeper. But uh, thank you to Laura Riley for putting information. I would urge you to join uh, any of our meetings for the uh, for our CW Ag Committee. We are, we are welcome everyone to the table and uh, really value your input. Anything else, Brenda? No, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Laura. Um, when is the next cafe, Laura? Our next cafe is on Thursday at noon, and it's um, an interesting conversation about conservation opportunities um, with the Chicago Bears' new development site at Arlington Heights. And I think that it's almost a continuation of this type of conversation about um, getting conservation practices implemented on the front end of a project rather than at the back end. So please join us. Um, I will redrop the cafe link into the chat 
and hope that you can all uh, be part of that discussion on Thursday at 12 noon. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the rest of your afternoon. Thanks so much. Folks are leaving, so I did. Hopefully, we'll join the chat. Did uh, I can take a screenshot? <laughs> what? Did anyone take a screenshot? I um I was uh...